Raiders only have three up by the line of scrimmage. Mac Jones hands it off on a draw to Ramondre Stevenson. Breaks out of a tackle at the 50. Has the 45. Breaks away from another tackle. Pitches it backwards. And now Jacoby Myers spinning around. He throws it to Chandler Jones in midfield. Stiffle. Chandler Jones racing towards the end zone. I can't believe what I just saw. Again! I can't believe what I just saw. This is unbelievable. I got the <laughs> uh, Honestly, I was just trying to catch my breath. Uh, when I got in the end zone, I was kind of just standing there. All my teammates kind of were just pushing me in every different direction. I really couldn't breathe. Uh, I couldn't see much. And then I guess we had won the game. It was wild. Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour, coming to you live after a wild weekend in the NFL. We had action on Saturday. We had action on Sunday. I'm Connor Rogers alongside Matthew Berry, Jay Croucher. Barry, looking a little different today. Well, I you know noticed. what? Like uh, Prior to last night's Sunday night football game between the Giants and the Commanders, I made a bet with Pete Domelotis, who is one of the producers here at NBC. He's a producer on this show. He also produces Sims Unbutton and a lot of other great shows here at NBC. He is a diehard, crazy Giants fan. And so we made a bet, a friendly bet, if you will, between two buddies about our respective teams playing on Monday Night Football. And the bet was that if the Commanders won, Pete was going to come on this show and read a poem uh, read a poem that was kind of an ode to the commanders. It was going to have to be a, a, a poem of his own writing praising the Washington commanders. And I said that if I would lost, that I would come on and wear a jersey of the opposing team that won the game. <laughs> and so I am honoring my bet for Pete. I, you know what? Give the refs the credit. Give the, you know, Pete, you, listen, a bet's a bet, man. A bet's a bet. And so we, when you lose, you lose. And so Hats off to the referees, um, to John Hussey and his crew. They won. You know, I mean, like, it is what it is. You go out to the, the field of play, and you, 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 try to, you try to do your best. Sometimes you come up short, and that's what happened here. The refs got the best of us. What are you going to do? You know, and the refs, by the way, move into the seventh spot of the playoffs. They are now looking good for the postseason. I don't know if you saw Steve Kornacki on Football Night in America, but the refs now like an 85% chance to make the playoffs after their victory over the Washington Commander. So congratulations all around. Let's hear from the commanders after the game, uh, their thoughts on the actual refs in this one. I, the call on Terry, Terry seemed pretty adamant he had pointed his hand out to the ref. What, what was the explanation? What did you guys see on, on the film? Looked like Terry pointed That's his hand out. That's exactly what I thought too, thank you. I, and I gotta ask about the Curtis one as well. Um, fourth it, it, the fourth down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, yeah. in fact, don't ask me about the refereeing because I can't answer the question. But Terry, he told, did you hear him tell you that you were okay? Yeah, I did. Like, that's why I'm giving him a thumbs up twice to make sure I was, I was good. But, I mean, in that event, I guess I can't make it close for a judgment call. But, uh, like I said, I feel like I checked with him twice. Good game last night, Matthew, I thought. Yeah, Good really right football. down the wire. A couple heated <laughs> moments. Yeah. So, all right. Like, so, like, can I ask you guys this? You guys, yeah. neither of you guys are Commanders fans. Or right? Giants I mean, fans. You're, 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 no, you're a Jets fan. I said or Giants fans. Or Giants We're completely fans. unbiased. Right, completely, I was yeah. going to say, exactly. Yeah. So you guys are actually both Jets fans, right? Yeah, say how I feel in a couple like, weeks. Right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. flip-flop a lot. Hour. You're Australian. You're really an Australian <laughs> rules football fan. But whatever. Connor is a well-known Jets fan. Whatever. So you guys, quote-unquote, got no dog in this fight. Correct. So I have a number of questions here. But my first one here is, is that from everything you know, and I know that you guys don't know Terry McLaurin personally, but from everything you know about Terry McLaurin and the reputation he has throughout the league and the clip that you just saw, and if you're listening on a podcast, that was the voice. Of, the second voice you heard was Terry McLaurin right there. Do you believe him? Absolutely. Or do you think he's lying? No, I, I don't do believe think, that man is a liar. No, yeah. I think he's telling the truth. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost certain Terry McLaurin's telling the truth. Scattered him coming out of Ohio State, a pristine character, just not the type of guy that would make anything up. He, ha he has been, I just can tell you, because I know a lot of the people around the commanders, he is – beloved there, beloved by the team, beloved by management, beloved by the community. There's a reason why it's not just his on-field play, but it's the character of the man. It's why he got paid what he paid in the offseason, because he is somebody that they believe is a true face of the franchise, that's somebody that they can be proud of and be behind. And, and so when Terry McLaurin says, 
I thought I was good. I asked him if I was good. The guy said, move up a little. I moved up a little. And then I turned to him again. I said, am I good? And he says, I'm good. And I give him the two thumbs. That's what he's, he's saying. Like, and that's why I did the two thumbs up because I'm good. And then they call the penalty. And then they take a touchdown off the board. Terry McCauley, who, who's jo- who, former NFL referee, who often gives the benefit of the doubt to the referees. He is our rules analyst here on NBC and Football Night in America. He was like, I wouldn't have called that. Terry McLaurin's like, I was told I was good. If you watch the play, and if you can go to my Twitter, you can see it. It's pinned to the top of my Twitter. He gives, they both give a thumbs up, right? You see it right here. Here, here, for those of you watching it as well. Look at that. It's a circle. Like, he gives the thumb up twice. Okay, great. Like, and then here, Brian Robinson goes in for um, uh, a, a touchdown that makes it within two points, right? Um, uh, obviously, hurts the commanders, hurts anyone who had Brian Robinson on their fantasy team. I had Brian Robinson anytime touchdown is a bet, hurts me. I lose money on this play. Um, there's a lot at stake with that particular play. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that had Brian Robinson in a, uh, in a fantasy matchup that had him as an anytime touchdown bet that had, that had him, uh, had, that had the commanders plus three and a half, which was the in-game line. Um, uh, so a lot of implications to that, but that's okay because all right, fine, whatever. It's a penalty. I mean, I actually, I mean, it's egregious. I don't get it. But then the next thing, <laughs> then on fourth down, do we have this? Do we have do we have this play when Ter- T- so Taylor Heineke goes back to pass and he's looking around trying to find Curtis Samuel and he doesn't find Curtis Samuel as you see it here on your screen you're watching it here right so Ter- T- Taylor Heineke he's running around he's trying to look he throws in the end zone there's Curtis Samuel nope the play is broken up the play is broken up and why is the play broken up because he's being <laughs> tackled <laughs> he's literally like he's like Such- that's. Like, by the way, in 25 states, that's assault. He's that close to this guy. He's all over the, he's all over Curtis Samuel. He's like, he, he's tackling. He, can we, can we take a shot of this? <laughs> Camera one, can we get in close of this? For, cause when we get to the video, like, look at that. He's like, literally, he's got his arms wrapped around him. I don't hug my mom that tight. What are we doing? And somehow, somehow this is not. Pass interference. The uh, the pool reporter uh, reporting from um, Hussey after the game said, you know, it's a judgment call and ultimately didn't think it was it was pass interference. Yet, despite the fact it was pass interference, I'm going to say a couple of things here and then we can wrap this up and move on. First off, by the way, the refs, in fairness, the refs were bad throughout the game. They missed. No, and I'm being honest. They they missed like no, they missed calls on the Giants sure, too. Because sure. I I hear all the Giants fans watching this going, oh yeah, well what about the you know what about the 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 fumble that should have been you know should have been a touchdown because he wasn't touched. Sure. And I'm with you. I 100. percent Now the fact of the matter is is like they had to slow it down to milliseconds. Like mm-hmm. it, it it was moving like this much before the ground. And I think that had it been called in real time, he's down to the ground. They probably would have touched him, and it may not have been a touchdown. We don't know. But is it a missed call? It's 100 percent a missed call. That you know the the thumb in Thibodeau's eye. I get it. Like. Bad calls on both sides. But that's egregious. And this is the thing that I tweeted, and then we'll move on. And and by the way, the other thing is is that the commanders, look, you can't fumble twice, right? You can't give up a strip sack uh, touchdown, which they did, and they also fumbled in their red zone. So two unforgivable mistakes in a a one-score game. But there is too much at stake. There is too much at stake in the NFL for them to get calls like this wrong. We have the technology. And I don't – listen, I, I'm angry and I'm having some fun here, but, like, the, like, I don't think the referees are bad guys. I don't think they're purposely trying to miss these calls. What I do think is I think they're, they're overmatched. I think the game is too fast. I think they are too old. I think it is just – it is moving too fast. They don't have the capacity to be able to judge these kind of – these bang-bang plays in real time. Now, admittedly, the pass interference one, that, that's inexplicable because, yeah. like, it's not a bang-bang play. You could like, all the, see I, like, we could all see yeah. it, like – like five seconds before the ball gets there. Like he's practically on the ground. And the McLaurin one also makes no sense because he's literally like, am I good? He hears I'm good. And then he caught like, but um, there is too much at stake. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And I know, I know the NFL wants to get it right. I know they do. And I don't know why it, it's impossible to do so. We have the technology. Re- make, it, make referees full time so they can spend all week long learning this. Have, have every play reviewable. 
right? I mean, we have that technology. Make every game forced to have the same number of cameras because based on the game, like NBC has more cameras there at a primetime game than the fifth regional on CBS does at one o'clock on a Sunday, right? Make sure there's a goal line cam every single, like these are fairly, and it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, but it's going to be a lot better. It's going to be a lot better. And it's just, it's costing people their job. Like there's a chance the commanders don't make the playoffs. And as a result, I don't know what, Daniel Snyder or whoever potentially a new owner of the commanders might say, but like, do they fire Ron Rivera? Do they, do they, do they decide to move on from Taylor Heineke? Jobs, like, are, jobs are at stake. Careers are at stake. Legacies are at stake. Not to mention, obviously the, the fantasy and betting implications of that game. Like, there's way too much at stake, way too much money, way too much real life stuff that is at stake in these games to us get it for, for people to get it as wrong as they're getting it. And it's not just happening to the commanders, right? The Minnesota game, it ended up not mattering because the Vikings ended up winning. But there were two touchdowns mm. called back on the Vikings that should have been touchdowns. The Raiders game, the Raiders, the, the Patriots should not have lost that game. No. And I can't believe I'm sitting here saying, like, the Raiders <laughs> got screwed by the refs because I feel like they always get the benefit of every call. But they did. It shouldn't have come down to that crazy play we started off with because Keelan Cole had his foot out. Like, I just... It's consistently bad is the problem. Consistently bad and consistently inconsistent. Yes. Like, it's not even like, yeah. I thought we were going to lead the show with Cardinals Broncos, so all this emotion <laughs> is quite surprising to me, but that's okay. Trace McSorley, Brett Rippon. Yeah. That's the game that doesn't Rippin for you. Game I just, here's the thing. I just, if the commanders lose, the commanders lose. And honestly, for much of the game, I mean, you know, the Giants made big plays when they needed to, and the commanders didn't. Again, the two fumbles are bad. But the commanders also ran at will. And they dominated time possession. And I think there was some, a lot of ticky-tack fouls. I thought the two-point conversion shouldn't have been called. I thought that was a, I thought that was a very ticky-tack play as well. I, I mean, I, I was watching that with Chris Sims, noted Giants homer Chris Sims. <laughs> you know, openly admits he's a From Giants New fan. Jersey. And, and, yeah, I mean, his father played. His father's a New York Giants legend. And literally Chris Sims was like, yeah, that probably shouldn't <laughs> have been called. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I just uh, – on the two-point conversion. Um, so, I just uh, – like, I want us to lose legitimately. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and we still might have. We still might have. Again, bad calls on both sides. But to have it, to have the Robinson touchdown called back and then the Samuel mugging not get called, like, it's awful. It's awful. Let's get into some of the fantasy implications from this game, and we'll go right down the line of the biggest games from I'm just the weekend. Take the rest of the segment. It is. <laughs> so, me and Jay have uh, so Giants <laughs> commanders covered here. <laughs> Big day for Saquon Barkley. The Saquon Barkley bounce back year continues. 18 rushes, 87 yards, 23 uh, fantasy points. That is his ties, his second highest total of the season. So for teams rostering or starting, obviously, Saquon Barkley in the first round of the playoffs, they get paid off the entire year. It's just been a great year for Saquon. Yeah, I think Saquon's kind of been forgotten about the past month because he hasn't, he hasn't really been done hurt. anything yeah. for a month, and he's been hurt. He's had really tough matchups. But, I mean, the commanders are a tough matchup as well, and he looked the best he has in four or five weeks. The I don't know what he was – like the last drive, just repeatedly the spin move just <laughs> over and over again. It was like LeBron James in the finals yeah. against the Warriors, just spin move to the hoop every single time, and the commanders just couldn't stop him. He was great down the stretch, especially when they knew – he was they were going to run yep. and he still was able to get through I think the most encouraging thing about Saquon was the receiving game sure. work 33 yards uh through the air that's his most since week five and so that was something that I thought was um uh really encouraging if you have Barkley on your team I don't know that there's any other takeaway from the from the Giants side of the ball um uh you know decent rushing from Daniel Jones on the on the Washington side of the ball just to talk fantasy here for a second Brian Robinson continues to look great and is the comeback player of the year but they play San Francisco at San Francisco on a short week after an emotional loss um, uh, against the Giants. And so other than Terry McLaurin, who has a 30% target share with Taylor Heineke, it's hard to get excited or recommend any player next week on the road at San Francisco, as we'll get into the week. But I think if you're a Commanders fan, uh, really, and I am, obviously, a very disappointing game. But the positives here are is that Jahan Dotson's a stud, man. Yeah, like, you know, points. I mean, like, but, you know, Brian Robinson's a stud. You know, I already know about Terry McLaurin. Um, Dotson's just awesome. Solid play from, from Curtis Samuel and Antonio Gibson. Like, there's stuff to – I mean, that's the thing. No, we'll see if the commanders make the playoffs or not, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is, like, they nailed that in the draft. Like, they, there are some real young building blocks to build around for the commanders. So, I'm just – as somebody who has Dotson in Dynasty, I'm excited. That, like, yeah. he's – 
that Chase dis- Young that coming back as well. Chase Young's coming back. It's not all bad for the Commanders. Yeah, look, the defense played fine. Like, I, you know, there were a couple things where, you, you know, they gave up the 97-yard t- uh, the, the drive and, like, couldn't get, you know. But, like, at the end of the day, they gave up 12 points. Yep. Well, you know what I mean? Like, he can't – you can't – they I gave him 13 points. I gave him – they gave him a touchdown and two field goals. Like, you can't blame the, the strip sack fumble touchdown on them. Like, yes. at the end of the day, they, they held the Giants to 13 points. Like, that should be enough to get a W in the NFL. Like, yep. I, I can't put this loss on the, uh, on the defense. No, I can't. No, Kayvon Thibodeau was a monster. He yeah, was. He was great. Great game. He was, he was unbelievable. He, was, uh, he deserves all the praise that he gets. Moving on to undoubtedly the most hilarious ending to a game we have seen at least this season. The Patriots lose to the Raiders. Um, we, we showed the play at the top. I actually want to show the win probability chart just to show how out of control this game got. So we'll th- show that in a second. There it is. I mean, this game, guys, was just all over the place, and the Patriots lose on – an egregious mistake with the pitch back at the end that goes right to Chandler Jones. It'll live forever. That play will live forever. It's the kind of quintessential Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of a just an idiotic as you, play. As you, as you see it here, Stevenson makes a great run here, but it's a tie game. And so they get an out, and so then he pitches it just before he goes down to Jacoby Myers. Jacoby Myers oh, no. Jones trying to on hit Jones, Jones, but doesn't get it to him. Chandler Jones is one who catches it. He just he just trucks Mac Jones. Poor Mac Jones gets posterized. He's like, I thought we were just taking a knee here. He was set up to die <laughs> yeah, on this know. play. And then Chandler Jones, and this is one of those, I don't know what they'll call it, but you know, this is this is immaculate reception. This is the catch. This is uh, you know, this is one of those, you know, this is the tuck rule. This is this is one of those iconic plays that I agree with you, Jay, will live on forever. Just, you know, like the the you know, the Stanford band, you know, the Stanford cow that yes. you know the, the band is know, out of the field. Everyone knows, right, right. Everyone knows like I don't know what they'll call this, you know, and there's the Music City mu- miracle. Yeah. They'll be it'll be you know, the Minnesota miracle with the, the I don't know what they'll call this, but um, the truck stick from hell. I mean, it's something, <laughs> uh, you know. I, I, but I feel yeah, bad for Mac Jones because yes. terrible spot to be in. It was like who did, DeAndre Jordan dunked on Brandon Knight, I think, and it like right. basically left Brandon Knight. But it was like basically that with Chandler Jones. Nobody stands a chance Mac in that Jones. spot. Yeah, yeah. Nobody. Right. But <laughs> poor, poor uh, Mac. beyond all that, what gets buried in this game is Ramondre Stevenson has a monster game. Monster game for fantasy playoffs. Yeah, you know, and it, what's. I think there's probably some people that missed out on a little. If you listen to fantasy football pregame, we were like, we believe Stevenson's play, likely to play, and I'm rolling with him. But the fact of the matter is, is he came into the game questionable. He hadn't practiced all week except a limited practice on Friday. He was considered a game time decision, likely to play. You know, when Damian Harris had been ruled out, but people weren't sure if he was, and it was a late game. So I could see there probably were some fantasy managers out there that like, I don't want to risk it that he doesn't play. I don't have a good pivot. I'm going to go with somebody else in an earlier game. And so they missed out on 24.8 fantasy points, just a monster game again. He scores the touchdown, 172. He also catches two balls as well. He had 68% of the Patriots running back carries. He's played four healthy games over his last his last four healthy games, and he hasn't left the game early. And he's averaging 18.3 fantasy points per game. You know, what's exciting is, is I think they tried him out. They, they were doing a little bit of a committee, right? Just 15 snaps in the first half for Ramondre. Um, you know, Pierre Strong and Kevin Harris saw some work as well. But then in, in the second half, I think they were like, okay, let's just ride Ramondre. 23 of his 43 snaps came after halftime. Looked no worse for wear, and they play. They're home to Cincinnati, they're home to Miami, and then at Buffalo. They're it, look. The Patriots like to run anyway as it gets colder, and especially like you know. I don't know that there's anything that you know. Uh, they're going to continue to write. Ramondre Stevenson is an RB one, despite regardless of matchup throughout the rest of the playoffs. Just just an absolute fantasy monster. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's too much to say about Ramondre. I think that on the other side of the ball. Darren Waller was, was relevant. Didn't, not, I don't think anyone really knew what to do with Darren Waller, but he has a decent enough day, gets in the end zone, which makes his day. And I think that just with the, the dearth of quality at the tight end position, he's someone that you're just going to have to start next week. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think that's right. I mean, like, I'll own this. Like I said on Fantasy Football Now, like, I want to see it first. Like, let's, let's, you know, let's see it. Like, who knows what kind of playing team he's going to have. Like, the report we got from Mike Florio uh, on the show is that they wanted to ease him back in. And by the way, that's exactly what they did. Yeah. He played less than half the snaps. He He's basically split time with Foster Moreau. He had a single-digit target share, just a 9% target share. Now, it pays off because one of the three receptions he had was a 25-yard touchdown. But at the end of the day, like, if I told you he's getting a 9% target share, he's only going to catch three balls in this game, you'd have been like, eh, I'm probably not going to start him. 
again, one of the one of them a little bit of a busted coverage, and he winds up with a 25-yard touchdown, which is Darren Waller. I agree with you, Jay, because it's such a low bar to clear in terms of fantasy relevance for a tight end. You're starting Darren Waller here, but I don't think the analysis like I'll completely own when I get wrong. Well, you man, know, when the analysis yeah, is wrong in a targets. lot of places, but I don't think it was necessarily on Darren Waller. The idea that. Waller would score against one of the better defenses in the NFL against defending tight ends, which is the Patriots. They're they're really good in terms of limiting tight ends, and he, he's getting a 9% target share. Like, fluky is what it is. I, I, I literally said, I think I said, I'm starting Chig Aconquo over Darren Waller. That's what I said on Fantasy Field pregame. By the way, it Chig Aconquo, <laughs> right, it was. I mean, exactly. Even with Waller's touchdown, I think he was only like two and a half or three points better than Aconquo. So, I mean, you know, anyway. But it is good news going forward uh, for the Raiders. They play the Steelers next week, which is a pretty good matchup for yep. Waller. I think just lastly in Waller, the good thing is if you have Waller on your roster, the fact that the Raiders won this game means their season stays relevant for at least another week. So there's no shutdown risk with Waller the next week or two, you would think. Yeah, I mean, the only – if there's one negative this game, and I don't know if there's a real takeaway, is it just a bad game for Devontae mm -hmm. Adams. Again, you know I mean? Like, we've talked about the run-heavy nature of the Raiders recently. This is now back-to-back -back weeks with under 11 fantasy points for one of, if not the best wide receiver in the NFL – 27 or more fantasy points in four of the previous five to this two-game stretch where he's been bad fantasy-wise. I think the Patriots made a key to try to, like, we'll, we'll give up three five-yard chunk plays to Josh Jacobs as long as Devontae Adams doesn't kill us deep. Again, going against Pittsburgh, that's a much better matchup. If you survive this week, you're still rolling out Devontae Adams. It's just a bad day at the office. What are you going to do? And not, You know, like, and that happens, you know, there are definitely people that just have really bad days at the <laughs> office. It happens. It does. Some have it bad happens. weeks. Some have bad Some weeks. Some have bad seasons. Yeah. Some have bad seasons. Moving over to the Jaguars with the big upset over the Cowboys, and we are going to play back very Sunday bold prediction. Jaguars, my swaguars, <laughs> beat the Cowboys trap at game. home. Again, trap game. I think Dallas, they should have lost to Houston last week. They're playing on borrowed time. They're looking ahead to Philadelphia. My swaguars, only four-point underdogs to the Cowboys. I think Trevor Lawrence pulls off the upset here. Give me All the right. Swagwars over the Cowboys, my bold Go prediction. Swagwars. And boy, did he. And as obviously, this was a game that took a drastic turn thanks to Trevor Lawrence. A monster day. Four touchdowns, over 300 yards. Trevor Lawrence continues uh, his hot streak and his breakout as a potential top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, uh, he looked awesome in this game. Like, and some of the drive, I mean, they were down in this game and, like, just again, Looked like a franchise quarterback. When you watch this game, like, he looked like a franchise quarterback, made big throws, got hurt by a couple of drops and, and that kind of stuff. But since week 12, guys, Trevor Lawrence is the third best quarterback in fantasy football, right? He's now had 24 or more fantasy points in three of the last four. Over the last four games, he leads the NFL in touchdown passes. He's got 11 over the last month as well. And so he now has back-to-back -back games with 300 or more yards, 300 or more passing yards and three or more passing touchdowns. We are seeing Trevor Lawrence finally shake off all the Urban Meyerness that got sucked into him in year one in his rookie and becoming the franchise guy that we all expected him to be when he was the number one overall pick out of Clemson. Next week, the Jaguars are at your New York Jets. So that's going to be a tough matchup here. Short week. But I think, and on a short week, right, the Thursday night game. But I just think he's good enough uh, and their weapons, and we'll talk about them in a second, and they're pass-friendly enough that I, I think, you know, Trevor Lawrence locked in as a QB1, and if you have him in Dynasty, which I do, you're pretty happy about this. Think about, they get Calvin Ridley next year. This is yeah. a really good offense. Second year, Doug Peterson, and they'll have, add Calvin Ridley to everything they've got going on. Things are looking up in Jacksonville. Yep. I think the great thing about Lawrence as well from a fantasy perspective is that the Jags' defense isn't good. Like, it's not good, yeah. and so he's in these high-scoring games, he's having to throw, and he gets a... It's not a good matchup against the Jets, but at the same time, despite the Jags' defense being bad, like, Zach Wilson can't move the ball. We'll get to that at some point, but the, the Jets cannot move the ball. It's not like the Jets are going to have 40 minutes' time of possession, so you'd expect Lawrence, even with the tough matchup, to continue. You have to start him at this point. Yeah, you, you, you absolutely do. I, and by the way, this is how annoying... Just to, Here's how annoyed I was about last night's game. Like, I was upset after this weekend because also I had, some, yeah, I had some tough fantasy luck in terms of, like... I, Played against Zay Jones in a couple of game weeks, and we'll talk a couple of leagues, and we'll talk about this. But I'm just like, so I nailed that bold prediction. That's a really good bold prediction. That what, the sound you heard was my bold prediction from Fantasy Football pregame, predicting the Jaguars to beat the Cowboys. Pretty good bold prediction. I can't even enjoy it. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I, I went, I went, I went two and zero on my, you know, my my bet em jam breakdown bets on Sunday Night Football. It's great. Can't enjoy it. Like, I'm so miserable and upset about about football this weekend. It just. Uh, 
That's all right. Taylor Heineke anyway, will anyway, lead you to the whatever. playoffs. I, beat San Francisco. Um, if there is one thing, like, so yes, I played against Zay Jones, and I wish, why do I have to be so smart, Connor Rogers? Because he was in the love list. He was in the love list. I, like, I wish, why couldn't this one have been one of my wrong calls? <laughs> but no, I had to be right. He's now got four receiving touchdowns in the last two games. He, since week 10, he's averaging double-digit targets here. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's really good. Like, huge factor like, in the red zone. Huge factor yeah. in the red zone. Like, you don't expect three touchdowns, obviously. That's crazy. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's a very narrow target tree in Jacksonville. It really is Christian Kirk and Zay Jones with some Evan Ingram sprinkled in. And so uh, given the elevated play of Trevor Lawrence, to your point about the fact that they, they're getting into these shootouts because the defense has struggled, you know, like Zay Jones, very viable going forward. I don't think three touchdowns is a fluke, but the production isn't. There's a reason why he was on the love list last week. Yeah, they've got a ceiling now as an offense too where, you know, all of these guys produced, they all had good games. Jones, Kirk, Ingram, Etienne, Lawrence, they all had good games. So, I mean, the Jags, I think you just have to treat them as a, an elite offense going forward. Absolutely. And Zay Jones just continues to be an absolute target monster. On the Dallas side of things, even in the stunning loss, a solid day for the backfield, both Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott uh, with good days on the ground. Tony Pollard had about almost 15 fantasy points. Zeke had 15.1 fantasy points. Here's the splits right here, guys, from yesterday. This is a committee that, or a duo that is, they're both being effective right now. They really are. Pollard's the more effective guy, but Zeke's getting the touchdown. He's now scored in seven straight games, and so he needs the touchdowns to really pay off, you know, but he's getting them. I mean, they're a highly efficient offense that's going to be scoring a lot. They love Zeke in the red zone, obviously. Since week 11, he's a top 10 fantasy running back. He's now had 18 or more touches in three straight games. Cowboys, really big matchup this week against Philadelphia. So Zeke and Pollard obviously will be involved. Like, Pollard's a top 10 guy. I mean, Pollard, since week is, since week 11, he's the third best running back in fantasy. I mean, the, the, the Tony, I feel like that's been an underrated story in fantasy this year is just how – how amazing Tony Pollard has been because it's been a timeshare with Ezekiel Elliott. But drafted as a guy that was, you know, sort of a, an insurance back and maybe a flex play to Ezekiel Elliott, he's full on become an RB1 over the last month. Yeah, and free the, agent, too. Yeah. It's the receiving work there as well, which he wasn't getting consistently at the start of the year. But he's had these huge receiving games. The Minnesota game was ridiculous, where he's basically a wide receiver for half yeah. of that game. And now, yeah, like you said, big matchup with the Eagles. Cowboys, one and a half point favorites in that. Not a lot of respect for the no other respect. ones. No respect. That's Eagles. insane. Yeah, I like Give the me Eagles, the Eagles. Yeah, Eagles. Eagles one. getting points? Yeah, yeah. Eagles should ooh, be ooh, 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 That's going to move. Ooh, 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 I feel ooh, like ooh, 100%. Percent People like the Cowboys. That's but, uh, true. The Cowboys are a big market. Yeah, the Cow. I mean... Like, Eagles are the Cowboys that good? Are we sure the Cowboys are that good? I thought they were a month ago, but now, no, I... after their recent results, like squeak home against the Texans, and I know the Chiefs squeaked home as well, but I think the Chiefs played a lot better against the Texans than the Cowboys did, and then they give up 40 to the Jags. Yeah, 100%. I agree with everything you just you just said. Like that. Smart guy. Yeah, he is a smart <laughs> yeah. guy, 100%. <laughs> Speaking of those... Would you like to, you like to be a referee in the NFL? I was going to say, do you want to ref yeah. the next game? Yes, yes I do. Yeah. There's a job for you yeah. on deck. I will, I will give you this in the, in the jersey. Give I'll give you this Francisco. jersey in, uh, in the break. Speaking of those 1-11 and 1 Texans that continue to just be annoying. They just hang yeah. around in games. They hung around for the Chiefs all the way to overtime. The How Chiefs, are the Texans against the spread this year? I bet you they're pretty good. They went through a good stretch. I mean, certainly they've covered the past two weeks with yeah. ease. Monster yeah. spreads. Double digits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, unbelievable. Almost double digits this week. Yeah. yeah. I, do, I do think this one was, like, the Chiefs, they fumbled three times. Yes. Some uh, flukiness. They, they missed the, the field goal from Bucket to win it. Uh, I think Justin Watson dropped the – was it he who dropped the 50 yard? Yeah, I think yep, so. Yep. Yeah. So, it was yeah. like, it could have very easily been a 20-point loss. Uh, because Mahomes did whatever he wanted in this game. 35 of 41, two touchdowns, spreads it around. Jarek McKinnon. Apparently That's the story of this game. Yes, Absolutely. Apparently the second coming of Tony Pollard, Jeremy McKinnon, just out of his mind again. I, I tweeted this out, and uh, I was half being serious, but, I, like, Jarek McKinnon is becoming everything we hoped CEH would be. And they're yeah. obviously very different running backs. McKinnon's a little bit smaller, but the fact of the matter is is that they're using him uh, massively in uh, in the passing game. He's just, you know, he's getting a ton of targets. Uh, right, you know, I mean, like, last week I sort of thought, well, the touchdowns were a little fluky. You know, the, the flip to him, and then he just yeah. races down the sideline, everything like that. But the fact of the matter is, is that his snap rate has increased for four straight weeks. He actually outsnapped Isaiah Pacheco 48-27. to 27. He actually had all four goal line carries in week 15. He now has back-to-back -back games with 32 or more fantasy points. You see it there on the screen. Not Dalvin Cook, not Derrick Henry, not Chris McCaffrey. Jarek McKinnon is your number one running back in fantasy for the second straight week as we head into Monday Night Football. And 
like I wonder if it's if it's a couple of things. Number one is is that you know listen, you earn more time on the field, right? You you produce and they you, they keep going back to you. I also wonder is like this is somebody that was in their system last year that was a key for them in the playoffs, and maybe they just know like look this is he's really good when he's out there, but he struggled with injuries, and so you know what we don't think he can be a full time back throughout a 17 week NFL season. And we feel pretty good about our chances of playing at the postseason. So we're going to use them sparingly throughout the season. And then as we start getting closer towards the playoffs, we're going to increase his usage and really lean on him. And that's what they've done the last two weeks. And I don't know why they would go away from him because it's working in a magnificent fashion. Yeah, I've always enjoyed Mr. McKinnon's work. Sure. He's always just been rock solid. And I yeah. think there is an element, too, is as you get closer to the playoffs, like, are they really going to be rolling with Isaiah Pacheco, a rookie in pass protection in the receiving game? Like, McKinnon's just so much more solid, I think, even if he doesn't have Pacheco's explosive upside. But, yeah, why wouldn't this continue? He, yeah. He's become the pa- – he, he's obviously already the passing down back on a team that throws a lot. But the fact that they're using him at the goal line, the fact they're using him between the tackles, to me, that's the eye-opener. Yeah, he's got two huge things going for him. He's a veteran, and you want veterans out there and keep playoff games. And he's got speed. Yeah. He's got speed as a pass catcher. And this is a team that's been looking to get more speed on the field. And then you look at Pacheco, fumbles in the second quarter, snap rates down. He's the kind of the guy that in between the 20s to get the ground attack going. It feels like the value is starting to go the wrong way. Maybe a little bit of a rookie he's, wall. He's kind of having the season – well, not really. But it, there's elements of what we thought Miles Sanders' year was going to be like that I think are kind of infecting Isaiah Pacheco at the moment where it is between the 20s. He's not getting the goal line carries. He's not the pass catching back. So he kind of needs to break one. Yes. Uh, yeah, he needs to break match. one outside of the red zone to have a really big day. Yeah, look, since week 10, he's running back 26 on a points-per-game basis. And that sounds about right, which yeah. is basically he's a touchdown-dependent flex. Now – I think more often than not, he gets in the end zone because they, they, they like him and they use him between the tackles and it's a team that's going to often be scoring position. Like, it's his sixth straight game with at least 15 touches. So you're telling me, hey, I, you can start a running back that's going to get 15 touches on the Chiefs? You like those odds, generally speaking. So, again, like, he wasn't terrible. He just, against the Texans, he should have had a much bigger day. And, honestly, I think McKinnon had the day we thought – Isaiah Pacheco was going to have. One of my shot for shots on fantasy football pregame was Isaiah Pacheco will have a top 10 fantasy day, 100 yards and a touchdown for Isaiah Pacheco. What I meant to say was Jarek McKinnon. So, like, <laughs> I just, if we could, yeah, I just, whatever, I, you know, I, I pulled a, lot a of names. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I pulled, a, I pulled a John Hussey. I screwed up. I think the issue with Pacheco is the Chiefs haven't been blowing teams out, and that was a huge part of his appeal, that he was going to get these garbage Close time touchdowns. The right. like, yeah. like, we, they're two touchdown favorites. Yes, but it just hasn't happened. Like, they haven't really blown anyone out since, ironically, they blew out the Niners in San Francisco at 21, which is really weird that they can blow out the Niners but not the Texans, but he's still providing value. Yeah. Our, our last game on the opener here, guys, Bucks bengals Everything looking great for the Bucks in the first half. They completely melt uh, and turtle in the second half. It looked like... Joe Burrow was going to ruin some fantasy playoffs for people with his first half, and then he hits the touchdown at T. Higgins, and everything kind of took off from there. Yeah, a, 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 a thousand percent. It was, this was a weird game. Very strange. It was very weird. Because just it was fumbles like, for it, fun. Yeah, it was like it was you know it was literally the tale of two halves here, where it's just like all Bucks and then all Bengals. Yep. So really quickly, but let's stay on the Buccaneer side of the ball. And here's the positives for us in the fantasy world: signs of life, uh, Brady. Brady, a really good fantasy day, at least for him, right? Three touchdowns and over 300 yards. He does have the four turnovers, which is tough, which limits him. But still, like, you you know, if I, more, more often than not, 300 yards and multiple touchdown passes, that's the Brady we expected to, um, to see. He's now had multiple touchdown passes in four of the last five games. Great game from Chris Godwin. We expected that. Mike Evans, a usable fan. Still doesn't get in the end zone, but still finally a usable game for Mike Evans. I don't know where Russell Gage comes up with two touchdowns. I think that's fluky. I, but I do think if you've been hanging tough with Mike Evans, you feel good about this. And I think Tom Brady, semi-viable, especially, by the way, their next Sunday night at Arizona. Like, I do think Brady is is viable next week against the Cardinals. Yeah, I actually, even though they lost by 11 and they blew a 17-point lead, I feel a lot better about the Bucks than I did kind of yesterday morning just because of the way they moved the ball against a good and improving Cincinnati defense. Like Brady, yes, it wasn't necessarily the most efficient, but he was over seven yards per attempt, which he hasn't been every week. So I like the minus four against the Cardinals, uh, and that's a good way to spend your Christmas night, betting the Bucks minus four against uh, the Arizona <laughs> right. Cardinals. Right, right, yeah. with us here on NBC. That's the, that's the Sunday night football out. game. 
right here on uh, NBC and Peacock. I'm a company man. Tyler Boyd gets in the end zone. He's now had at least five targets in eight of the last nine games. So in games in which teams struggle against the slot, which Arizona somewhat does, like I do think Tyler Boyd's interesting. And T. Higgins, make if he survived last week and T. Higgins is goose egg, he makes up for it. Five for 33. He gets a touchdown. Plays 80% of the snaps, which I think is important given the health questions. He's now scored a touchdown in three straight games that he's played. I don't think he can count last week as a game that he played. Uh, but, the you know, the Bengals did what the Bengals do after a rough start. You know, they turned it on. Yeah, Burrow spread the ball around. All three wide receivers get in the end zone. Plenty yeah. more action from the weekend. A lot of players having And, and it's interesting. It's the, the, the only thing that's kind of like, you know, eyebrow raising about the Bengals was sort of the running back usage. We don't have to get into too much of that. We can, as we get further on, but that was the only thing was like, Mixon had the majority work. P. Ryan looked like the more effective running back, you know, and the numbers suggest that as well. So just as we, as we break down next week's games, we'll have the rest of the week to sort of talk about it, but just Mixon's not out of the woods yet in terms of having all the touches from Samaj yeah. P. Ryan. And maybe the wear and tear has caught up to him a little bit. They really ran him into the ground the first couple of months yeah. of the season. And, and give credit where credit's due. Samaj P. Ryan's good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He's, he's playing well. Exactly. Jarek McKinnon-ish. Very, yes. <laughs> like a young Jarek McKinnon out there. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, Thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.